Hello and welcome to the Microbe Discovery Project's live author hangout. I'm James Ockenden, a volunteer in Hong Kong and your host for today's fundraising event. Thank you for joining. We have a very special guest with us live online, Elizabeth Tova Bailey, the author of the much loved book, The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, James. I'm very happy to be here again for our Hello. last uh, session. Yes, great. And Elizabeth will read from her book in this final session and answer your questions from her home in Maine, USA. Uh, and if you have any final questions for Elizabeth, then please email them to microbediscovery at gmail.com. Elizabeth uh, has now, this is the last of four unique live readings to cover every time zone uh, across the world. And this will be the final live hangout this weekend. And we're on the topic of sleeping, eating, and snail romance. So just quickly to explain the fundraiser, your donations today will support the Microbe Discovery Project. This is an initiative pioneered by MECFS patients themselves in support of Dr. Ian Lipkin's research into this disease. Dr. Lipkin is a world-renowned scientist well known for his work on SARS here in Hong Kong on the current Ebola outbreak um, and the MECFS community is very lucky to have him working on MECFS research. The patient group has already raised more than $150,000 for Dr. Lipkin's uh, research, but we need more funds to move the research forward. So to donate during or after the show, please visit the links on the slideshow and be assured 100% of your donation goes directly to Columbia University earmarked to Dr. Lipkin's MECFS research project. And now for Elizabeth's reading for session four, Sleeping, Eating and Snail Romance. And as it's our last session, we have a very special bonus. Elizabeth is going to finally reveal the actual sound of a wild snail eating. <laughs> ah. All right, let's start with that unusual sound here and see if it comes through okay. So this is the actual sound of a snail eating that's been recorded. There you go, James. Have you heard anything like that before? Okay, I've never heard anything like this <laughs> small munching. <laughs> It's actually grating. Those 2,642 teeth are grating at a carrot. Right. Which is not what a forest snail normally eats, but they like them because they actually have a sweet tooth, and a carrot is, is pretty sweet. So. Right. It's a substrate recording. We actually recorded the sound not through the air, which would be an airborne recording, but through the carrot itself. Mm. So the vibrations going through the carrot. Oh, my. So with this last, go ahead. Sorry, carry on, carry on. So with this last reading for Dr. Lipkin's microbe discovery project, um, which I am behind fully, I think the research is extremely important for future diagnosis and treatment options. I am going to read um, starting in chapter 11, Colonies of Hermits, a little bit about snail eating and then a little bit about snail hibernation. The foraging of snails is complex. They vary their diets to balance their nutrient intake. Two snails of the same species in the same location may make different dining arrangements. They are intrigued by a new food but proceed cautiously. After inspecting it with the lower tentacles, which have the taste buds, they take a small taste. If there are no unpleasant side effects, they will return for a larger portion. And a little bit from chapter 14, Deep Sleep. A snail, unhappy with its dining options or uncomfortable with the weather, will go dormant. Its heart rate slows to just a few beats per minute, and its oxygen intake diminishes to 1 50th of its active use. Perhaps it was my insomnia combined with the way my unusable time kept evaporating, but of all the traits the snail acquired through evolution, dormancy seemed to be the very best. 
Like Sleeping Beauty, a snail may not wake until circumstances are favorable. Though like Rip Van Winkle, it may wake into a changed world. I wondered what happened to snails during the last ice age. And so I asked the malacologist Tim Pierce if he thought a snail could outglide an advancing glacier. He speculated that some of the larger terrestrial snails might possibly outpace a very slow flow of ice. I thought of a tiny snail with a glacier bearing down on it. As the glacier slid closer, the temperature would drop. In response, the snail would dig a burrow and hibernate, and the glacier would flow right over it. Even a snail couldn't last through a deep sleep of a hundred thousand years. It came down to this. I envied my snail's many abilities. I wished I could create an upperfram to seal myself off like a snail does with its shell at a moment's notice. If I couldn't, like a snail, have strength equal to many times my weight, I'd settle for just getting my normal strength back. If I couldn't glide straight up a wall or sleep stuck to the ceiling, I wished I could at least walk upright with the rest of my species. I wanted to escape from the chink of illness in which I was stuck. How wonderful it would be if we humans with illnesses could simply go dormant while the scientific world went about its snail-paced research and wake only when new safe medical treatments were available. But why limit such an amazing ability to the ill? When a country faced famine, what if the entire population could go dormant to get through a hard time in a safe and peaceful way until the next growing season came around? Mm, yes. Well, thank you very much. So um, we have a question. Um, and I think it's quite a common question that you, you probably get this all the time. Most people would think that a snail is quite dull. How did you get so much plot and intrigue into a book about a snail? <laughs> well, I guess it unfolded slowly. <laughs> um, some of it was that there actually was some surprising plots in the life of my snail. And some of it is having to do with the fact that I, I pulled so many wonderful quotes and excerpts from other writers through hundreds of years and many countries into the book as well, such mm. as um, Patricia Highsmith, who wrote some pretty um, terrifying short stories about snails, mm. and Elizabeth Bishop, Gerald Durrell, Italo Calvino, um, a lot of Japanese haiku, just wonderful pieces about snails so that it really kind of deepened the plot around my own snail's life during the year I watched it. Yes. Had you, uh, did you research those uh, snail writings, so to speak, or were you aware of any of those before you um, became interested in the snail? Most of it I researched. A few things I was, um, you know, were familiar, like A. A. Milne's poem about a very small snail. Um, so there were a few pieces that I was familiar with and some of the haiku I was familiar with, but mm. there was just so much more that I found. Yeah. The snail is called James as well, isn't he? The uh, A.A. Yes. Mills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a line, the, uh, and there is the very small snail named James. Yes, and there's a beautiful <laughs> line, something about the, the huffle. Is it the huffle of an angry, no, the huffle of a... The huffle of a snail in danger. A snail in danger, yes, beautiful yes, word. <laughs> which, which I think he made up, because a snail can't really make a huffle, but it's a wonderful <laughs> line. <laughs> yes. Okay, so why did you decide to write a book about a snail? Uh, did you know how the book would turn out when you started the project? I didn't have any idea it would, it would turn into the book that it did. Um, I wrote it partly as a thank you to the snail because I really felt that it, I would not have survived that year without it. And also um, to try to find, as I talked about in the last session some understanding of why illness would happen to someone out of the blue and how you deal with it at that point. But I did not know that it would turn into the book of so much natural history and so many other writers' voices as well. Um, I 
started with my observations and then it was a, a number of years later that when I started to think about the book I started to do the scientific research mm. and then I sort of combined those two and that the differences and similarities between the snail and the human gave me a framework in which to write about illness because it's very hard to write directly about illness it's hard to write about it hard to read about it mm. but with a framework I created it was a little bit easier to pull that piece in right right so would you say uh, then that the snail is the main character in your book um, because there are really only two characters, two main characters, yourself, a human, and the snail, this uh, gastropod, and this interspecies relationship seems rather unusual. It, it was unusual. <laughs> and um, it, I think it, it kind of delighted me that I was working on a book about that had two main characters, a human and a snail. Mm. Um, you know, a bedridden woman and a silent small snail, you wouldn't think you could make a book out of that. Mm. But I think if you take any two species and create a relationship between them, there's a lot to say, mm. just as there is in any relationship. And I was living with a snail at my bedside 24-7. So I think there's always a lot to say about any relationship. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, lovely. Well, moving from relationship to romance, now is the uh, time for the next reading. Okay. So, if you are ready there, then uh, take it away. All right, this is from um, chapter 16, Affairs of a Snail. A snail may find a partner randomly or show a preference for age or size. They mate in late spring, early summer, or fall after an elaborate and complex courtship. A terrestrial snail that has been isolated for a while can rather conveniently self-fertilize, thus founding a new colony and ensuring the survival of its genes. Snails, some snails use love darts, which Der, uh, Gerald Durrell describes as tiny, beautifully made arrows. I'm sorry, Gerald Durrell describes these in a passage in his own book. And my description of these is that they are tiny, beautifully made arrows of calcium carbonate. They look as if they've been crafted by the very finest of artisans. They are formed inside the body of the snail over the course of a week and can be as much as one-third the length of the shell. The dart shaft is hollow and circular and depending on species may have four fin-like blades which are sometimes flanged. One end is harpoon sharp, while the other end comes to a flare with a corona-like base. A romantic encounter between a pair of snails can take up to seven hours from start to finish and involves three phases, starting with a lengthy courtship. As Louis Agassiz said in the last century, whoever has had the opportunity to observe the lovemaking of snails will not question the seductiveness, seductiveness of their movements and airs, which anticipates the amor amorous embrace of these hermaphrodites. That's okay. a little bit about the snail's romantic life. Yes, that's as much about snails as <laughs> we ever wanted to know now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot more. <laughs> Yes, yes, well, that's one, wonderful, wonderful. So, I mean, did, did you know much about, I mean, any of this or about snails before, before you first met one, so to speak, in your bedroom? I really didn't. I mean, like most humans, I thought that it was quite, that they were, you know, kind of cute because they could, they had these wonderful tentacles and they had these mobile houses, their shells, that, that they could wander around with. But like, you know, most people, they were small and um, slow moving, so I wasn't that interested in them before I started to watch one. Mm. But I began to do a lot of um, research, reading a lot of books on gastropods, and eventually found a wonderful snail consultant, Tim Pierce, at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in, at Pittsburgh. And he was wonderful because I could email him or call him with um, a lot of snail questions. Yeah. And so that was very helpful. Uh -huh. What do they call them, the profession uh, that study the snails? Um, a, gas a snail is a gastropod which falls under the larger group of mollusks. Right. And so the, the field is called malacology. 
Okay, okay. So you befriended some malacologists. Yes. Or one in particular, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and what did they think about, uh, you know, this, this lady? Uh, obviously, you know, it's their life's work. And what did they think about you taking on this project and, and writing uh, in oh, such detail? Tim really loved it. I think initially, the first two years when I was pestering him with questions, he was incredibly patient and kind without even knowing what the outcome of all my questions and my writing would be. So I think he was um, quite pleased when he saw the final book manuscript, which I, ha I asked him to read just so I could make sure I had the science completely right. Mm. And now he's very happy because he he calls me the ambassador for the snails. Right. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> you know, it's not a, it's not a field, it's not a romantic, it's not a high profile field as it would be if you studied lions or even elephants. Yeah. So as a scientist studying snails his whole life, yeah. this book has really given the field, um, given it a little bit more popular attention. Fantastic. You can be the Jane Goodall of snails, maybe. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> did you also get involved, because there is obviously uh, an element of, of the, the, the disease um, and the sickness which, which struck you down in, in the book, did you also get involved in medical research? I did. I'm, I... You know, I, I think I always liked I always liked science. I took some biology and geology in college, but I was uh, really an English major writer. But um, after getting ill, I have gotten very interested in following the medical research and even being in a lot of medical research studies. Mm. I it, for me, I, it gives me a lot of hope to be able to be involved that way. Some patients are less interested in the medical research. Mm -hmm. But for me, it, it brings me hope just to know that it's out there, that it continues to um, bring us new information about a really difficult disease yes. and illness. Yeah. How did, you, uh, how did you first hear about Dr. Lipkin's study that we're, that we're fundraising for here today? Um, let's see. I, well, I, I was aware that he had become very interested in CFS. Mm. And I became interested in the microbiome, too, which I think is sort of the last frontier. Um, you know, genetics was so important in the last decade, and I think the microbiome now is going to be extremely important right. in a lot of diseases, a lot of autoimmune diseases, and even some cancers, and, and hopefully in CFSME. Yeah, okay. Good. Now, um, I understand your book gets read by healthy people um, and by patients and by medical professions, uh, professionals. Did, did you have any idea it would have this wide reach to not, not just sort of the MECFS community, but this, this very broad, um, popular appeal? I think I, um, I really, really wanted to reach both groups, both completely healthy readers who didn't usually like to read about illness, but I also... It's very close to my heart to write a book that patients would um, feel was important to them and of help to them. Mm. I didn't know if I was succeeding until the book manuscript was finished and it started to be read, um, but it does seem to have crossed both, um, both readerships, and I'm particularly delighted that it's being read by medical professionals and researchers. That's really pretty neat because... Um, a lot of the medical researchers don't have direct contact with patients. They're not clinicians. Mm. And I think it, a lot of the CFS researchers that aren't clinicians, it gave them some insight into the illness. Um, and it's also wonderful that some physicians read it. Um, I've had physicians that suggest it or give it to patients, and I've had patients who have suggested and given it to their physicians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's wonderful that, that it's being used to sort of expand under, understanding. Yes, yeah, communication between the, the patients and the, and the professionals. Mm -hmm. Lovely. So uh, you also mentioned the book is being used in high schools and colleges. You do a lot of uh, Skype calls, for example, with, with schools. How do the younger people respond to the illness part of the book? Um, that's a good question. And, and before I answer that, I was going to mention that there's a new field called medical humanities that actually uses literature, like my book, Medical Humanities, Personal Accounts, mm -hmm. in order to help new physicians um, 
improve communication skills. Yeah. And then in the high schools and colleges, it's being used in biology and literature classes. And I think it's just wonderful that um, it, it's it's very interesting. I just Skyped into a college class, actually, last week, um, Mount Holyoke. And I've worked with a high school in Maryland for three years in a row. And the students get very interested. I think it's... Um, it's it 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 help you know that it, they think they realize that things can go wrong in life now and then, mm -hmm. but then they're also reading an account of somebody that survived that situation. Mm -hmm. So I think it um, it adds some depth to the sorts of readings that they normally have in science, which lack that humanistic perspective. Mm -hmm. So they they seem to respond to it extremely well, especially the fact that it's interdisciplinary and combines. Um, a lot of real natural history science with this medical humanities piece. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely. So medical humanities, that's, uh, you said that's a new, uh, a new field. It's, it's not so new? much new, but it's, it's, um, it's a, probably a few decades old, but it's burgeoning right now. Almost, right. almost every medical school now is adding a medical humanities course that yeah. includes art, literature, music, yeah. um, to try to broaden um, and add some human elements to what otherwise is a pretty science, straight science medical degree. Okay, and adding some snail elements as well now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we've come to the we're coming to the end. Um, just wanted to ask Elizabeth. You know, I, you've read so much of your book to us over the last uh, over the day and, and and since yesterday. Just wondering if you know. Obviously, you've enjoyed it. From our talks, but uh, was there any sort of particular part of sharing the book that you particularly enjoyed with the with the viewer? I think that I often, um, if I'm doing a Skype to read, I often read more about the snail, and this was a wonderful experience because I felt this particular um, group of sessions will reach patients and people that are supporting CFSME. So it was particularly wonderful to read more of the illness passages, mm. uh, very moving to me to be able to read those to potentially other patients um, mm. who have experienced this illness. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for, uh, you, for your time in sharing these, uh, sharing these and your thoughts over the last uh, 24 hours. It's really been a lovely experience. Um, and well, thank you, James, for hosting. It's been Terrific. Yeah, my pleasure, my absolute pleasure. And uh, yes, yeah, so we've been listening to Elizabeth Tova Bailey, author of The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating, in support of the Microbe Discovery Project, a fundraiser for Columbia University's Dr. Lipkin. So if you haven't had the chance to donate to this important research uh, initiative, please do so. Look at the uh, links on our slideshow here. Please share this video with your friends if you would like. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. So from me in Hong Kong and from Elizabeth in Maine, it's uh, goodbye now. So bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.